So Mayor, I know that you spoke with my colleague Jennifer on Sunday and you briefed her a little bit about the conversation that you wanted to start about the possibility of a 35 day order for staying at home in Austin. <coughs> since that time, since Sunday, has anything changed with that conversation? No, I think that, uh, you know, all the options that the community might want to consider should be out on the table. Uh, and we don't seem to be having a lot of conversations about schools in the fall. Everybody's focused on trying to get past the, the, the next couple of weeks in the hospitals. Uh, but having a conversation about schools in the fall, I thought might be a good thing. Uh, the modelers uh, that are going to give the council a briefing on Thursday, uh, I've asked them to discuss uh, uh, schools. Uh, so we'll learn more then. And just to make sure that it's clear for folks who don't understand the way that these orders work, at this point, the only way that you could have the power to enact a 35-day stay-at-home order would be if the governor granted you that power, correct? I think the conventional wisdom is that uh, cities can't do that kind of thing uh, unless the governor either orders it or allows the cities to act. And one of the things that I saw was yesterday, the governor did a, a televised interview. I don't know if you had a chance to, to see that, but he actually had some commentary there about local enforcement. Um, and I'm gonna read you a quote from that interview. He said, all of those local officials who are asking Texas to shut back down They've absolutely refused to enforce the current executive orders that are already in place. What they need to show is action, not absenteeism. They need to show up and enforce the law as it is before they're given any further authority. They ask for more and more, but they do absolutely nothing. So what I wanted to ask you, Mayor, is to your understanding, has Austin absolutely refuse to enforce the current executive orders to the fullest extent possible as he was suggesting? No, I think it's pretty obvious that the, the city, uh, its elected officials, myself included, uh, have probably been, um, um, uh, we've been incredibly active in trying to bring information to our community and to get our community to change behaviors. Uh, I'm, I am uh, uh, encouraged uh, by the amount of behavior change that's occurred in our city over the last couple of weeks as we've talked about what's happening in our hospitals and the like. But as we have said from the beginning of this crisis back March, there are not enough police officers or deputy sheriffs for something like this to work, uh, enforcing it one person at a, at a time, arresting somebody or or finding somebody. This has to be something that the community wants to do because the messaging and the information is very clear. That's why I was disappointed in how long it took for the governor to issue an order uh, saying that masks were required all over the city and in cities across the state. He didn't do that until last Thursday, not because it was important to be able to put people in jail, but because the failure to do that sends a mixed message to the community. The community's not sure whether it's important to do, whether it's effective to do. Uh, and so I'm very, I'm pleased that the governor finally did that. Uh, and I think that it's helpful when he does because it, people need to hear more from him other than he encourages masks. They need to hear that it's important enough for it to be mandatory. When that happens, we have businesses that make it mandatory. Uh, businesses that were reticent to do it because they don't want their employees and customers fighting at the front of the store about whether the customer can come in or not or has a right to come in or not uh, without a mask. It's very easy for a business to say the law requires that you have to put on a mask. So we're doing, I think, right now uh, 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 everything that we could be doing uh, to encourage our community to do the right behaviors. We're doing everything we can to actually achieve uh, that measure of compliance. So specifically to that claim that Austin has refused to enforce current executive orders, you would disagree with that? 
I do, because I, I don't think that you enforce those orders by, by arresting somebody or, or handing out some, some tickets. It's not, we can't, that's not how you change a, a community's uh, attitude and, and action. Uh, I am dealing now with uh, uh, my president of my police association who says that the, the governor's order doesn't let them detain people to give them a ticket because the, the governor was careful in his order to say that uh, uh, in support of the, his mandatory masking, you couldn't detain or stop anyone. Uh, I'm trying really hard not to get into this kind of squabble between my governor and the president of my police association uh, and trying just really to focus on trying to keep the community as safe as possible. Another point that the governor brought up related to his mask order, he seemed to be suggesting that enforcing that mask order to the fullest extent would result in the changes that Texas and cities like Austin need to slow the spread of the coronavirus. In your view, is the governor's mask order enough to stop the challenges that we're seeing in Austin, such as increases in hospitalizations and concerns about ICU capacity? I think that wearing masks are, are incredibly important, and that's why for the last couple of months we've been trying to get the governor to, to make it something that was mandatory. Uh, but the advice I'm getting from the doctors and the experts uh, is that masking alone is not sufficient. Uh, it's real important for people to observe social distancing uh, whenever and wherever they can. Uh, it's important for people to wash their hands. It's important, I think, for people to avoid the large groups that the governor's order allows people to participate in. And I know the governor says that we can, but we still urge our community not to do that. Um, if we're urging our community to stay home when you can, as our governor does, uh, because that's the safest place for people to, to, to be. Uh, but I think it would be better if the governor didn't have so many exceptions for large groups. And in regards to the possibility of a 35-day shutdown, have you had conversations with county commissioners or with your fellow city council members or other local leaders about this possibility in the last couple of days? You know, we've had conversations uh, uh, about the kinds of things that uh, should be presented to our community. I'm not proposing a 35-day shutdown. Uh, and I think that shutdown should be a last resort, but I have been approached by some people in the community that have asked if there's a better chance of being able to sustain school openings if we were to tamp down the virus more. When they ask me that question, I think that's probably a, a legitimate question for people to ask, especially people that are concerned about schools in the fall. Uh, and that's why I've asked the, the, the scientists and the doctors uh, to discuss it Thursday publicly. Uh, when the city council is getting it, is getting its briefing. And so the the county judge and the county commissioners as well. I know they it was discussed briefly during their meeting today. Have you reached out to them to say, hey, should we be talking about this? I haven't talked to the county commissioners about it, but I have talked to uh, the, the the leadership team uh, in the in the county. So um, uh, Judge Bisco through. Um, uh, Sarah Eckhart, uh, and I've talked to the experts uh, about it. I've talked to Dr. Escott uh, about it. Um, again, there's no proposal to do that, uh, but having a conversation about things that we might, could do or not do, uh, that would increase the chances of schools staying open, appears to be something that at least some people in the community do want to talk about. And you mentioned Dr. Escott. I was listening in earlier at the county commissioner's meeting when he presented for them. Were you able to tune into that? I didn't see that. That's okay. I, I transcribed it. So I'm going to read to you what he said to the county commissioners. Um, he said, we are awaiting on some data elements to come out over the next couple of days to make a better informed recommendation. I think looking at the corrected numbers, we are certainly going to be in the red zone over 70 new hospital admissions on a seven day moving average. But as I pointed out in my earlier slides, it appears that we could be experiencing a decreased number of new cases. If that trend continues today and tomorrow, the answer could be not yet. I think that going out into the community that people are being more protective and with the governor's orders regarding masking, 
I'm hopeful that we will see further flattening of the curve. And I don't think any of us, including the mayor and the city council, want us to close things down if we can find that sweet spot where we can decrease transmission enough while keeping things open. Do you agree with Dr. Escott that we need more data in the coming days to know whether or not to recommend a 35 day shutdown? So the risk chart that Dr. Escott prepared with the modelers have us in the orange zone and it has us moving into the red zone somewhere between 70 new hospitalizations a day and 123 new hospitalizations a day. So whether we move from the orange and the red zone depends on, on whether or not we use the 70 number or the 123 number or a number in between. In order to know where within that range we need to apply to decide whether or not to go into the red zone, we said that we would take a look at the speed, the rate at which we entering into that 70 new hospitalizations a day or 80 or 90 or 100. It's the speed at which we enter into it. Two weeks ago, we were moving at a really high rate of speed. So if you had asked me two weeks ago, should we go into the red zone when we hit 70 or 80 in that range, I would have said that's the advice I'm getting because of the speed at which we're entering. But then we went to the community and we asked the community to try to change that trajectory, to lower the speed or the rate at which we enter. We haven't seen the data yet. We'll know more this week. Um, I've anecdotally it appears to me we did a better job this July 4th than we did in Memorial Day, but we need to see the data. But I feel like the community has maybe slowed that trajectory. And if the community has slowed that trajectory, then we don't have to go into the red zone at 70 or 80. Maybe we can wait till we get to 85 or 90 to be able to do that. And that's the information and data we'll get this week. This week we'll be addressing the question, at what rate of speed do we think we're entering into that range of new hospitalizations? And it sounded like Dr. Escott was saying that new projections from the UT modeling team that will be presented in the coming days will be really pivotal in determining what that recommendation is going forward. Is that your understanding as well? I think it is. You know, we've been relying on the scientists and the doctors all along. Uh, so the information that comes from them will be critical. Uh, it's not any one piece of information or one study. It's the collective information we're getting from the doctors and the experts, but certainly the modeling from the University of Texas is one really key component. And there's a special called council meeting on Thursday. There are two items on the agenda so far. Both of them are, are sponsored by, by you. I was wondering if you can help me translate what those items are. I read them as they're listed on the agenda, but I'm not sure exactly what, what they would entail. So are you able to help explain what exactly those are aiming to do? So Thursday's special call meeting has three things. The primary thing is our weekly update on the COVID virus that the public can all watch as we watch it because it's important to get the information out. We also have two other items that the council can take up and consider. And both of them are aimed at giving the city additional enforcement tools to help enforce uh, either the governor's order or, or my order or the Travis County uh, order. Uh, and those two tools are one, uh, making it clear that an order by Dr. Escott can have the force of law and it can be enforced separate and apart from uh, the emergency orders that uh, the judge or I enter uh, as, uh, as agents for the, for the governor. And then the second one uh, is again to provide an additional enforcement tool uh, that has the city under its general law nuisance powers declare a property that is fostering or enabling the, the transmission of disease, something that the city can declare a nuisance and then take to, to court in order to be able to, to, to close down a use. Uh, for example, the, the governor closed bars, uh, but he's now been sued by some of the bar owners uh, to try to reverse that. 
Uh, if that gets reversed, it may very well be that it's up to the cities through nuisance actions uh, to be the ones to, 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 to prevent that kind of conduct and behavior uh, from, from happening, uh, just because it presented such a risk for the transfer of the virus. Hmm. And the authority that you guys are discussing about granting Dr. Escott the ability to issue his own orders that would act as law in Austin, would that allow Dr. Escott the authority to issue a city or countywide shutdown or stay home order? You know, I don't know the answer to that. At this point, we're not doing anything on Thursday that goes beyond uh, what it is that the governor has in his order. And so to be clear, while you've been having conversations about the possibility of whether or not we should enter into a shutdown based on the data. What you guys are discussing and possibly taking action on with council on Thursday would not be authorizing a shutdown. No, I, I mean, we'll, we'll discuss the data on Thursday. My understanding uh, from a really preliminary look at the data is that we're probably uh, impacting that criteria, that trajectory in a way that uh, we, we may not need to, to immediately uh, request the or, or immediately have the city uh, move to a, to a shutdown. Uh, so I don't think it's something that we're going to have to confront on, on Thursday. Got it, got it. Because I know there was, there was an in, uh, insinuation at the commissioner's court that those two items that you were sponsoring would make that 35 day shutdown happen and you're saying that that's not the case. No, the, the, the resolutions that have been filed back up to the agenda, neither one of them speaks to a 35 day close down and neither one of them would have the council voting on closing down. Uh, it's setting up two enforcement tools. It's setting up a way to create a, a nuisance action uh, if there's a determination that a property is being used in a way that spreads disease. And the other one uh, under chapter 122 uh, gives uh, the, the orders of the, of the health uh, officer uh, the, the, the weight of law and something that could be enforced. That's all that they are. The last point that I wanted to bring up was Dr. Escott had mentioned today a hiccup in data collection related to hospitalizations. I'm not sure if this is something that you're aware of, but he'd mentioned that with some of the hospitals for people who were in the hospital already and after they'd already been admitted were found to have COVID later on, i.e. they were not initially admitted for COVID, that those people were not being entered into the total data numbers for COVID hospitalization. So if I went into the hospital for a broken elbow and then they found out that I had COVID later on, that my name was not being entered into the, the hospitalization data. With the potential that unreported hospitalizations could affect what stage Austin is at in terms of the, the risk factors that we're looking at, how do you think that the, the hospitals and Austin Public Health have done in terms of providing accurate, timely data about the COVID patients that we're seeing currently? I think the hospitals are doing a good job of presenting data. Uh, and we're getting data from the hospitals in lots of different ways. Uh, and, you know, we've created the systems for the hospitals to be able to share data. So we've had to, to build the system. Uh, and as we get more into it, we, we learn additional th things as we go through this process because it is brand new. My understanding from talking to the modeler briefly uh, about the additional information would indicate that we may have underreported the count from June 23rd uh, until the, the 5th, uh, but I don't think that the uh, uh, undercount is sufficient to change any of the conclusions or the directions uh, that, were, that we're on. Um, the numbers prior to that time all being reported, I think the way that we uh, picked up all the data that we would have wanted, but we changed people and processes on that day. Uh, but 
everybody is working really hard, I think, to make sure that the decision makers and the public have all the information and data that they need. We're constantly going over the data. That's how we saw uh, that there might have been an issue with the data for about a week. Uh, so we're now backfilling that data to make sure that that's covered. The real question is not, are we at 70 or are we at 75? Because that's not in terms of daily new admissions. There's not that much difference between those kinds of numbers. What we're really looking at, I think, this week is the speed at which we're entering that 70 to 123 range. Hmm. Okay, so it sounds like you were up to speed about what Dr. Escott had mentioned about some of the that confusion with the reporting of the hospitalization numbers. I'm knee deep in these numbers all of the time. I I should have I should have known I should have known. Um, great, and and as far as that goes, did you have any additional insight as to why there was that confusion that? resulted in the potential underreporting of those numbers? I don't know. I'm not sure that they were underreported because I think we're getting lots of information from the, from the hospitals. Uh, and then as the information comes in, then uh, Austin Public Health, the Dr. Escott, then pull information off the reporting forms in order to be able to create the, 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 the charts that they, that they want uh, and the charts that end up appearing on the, on the dashboard. Uh, my understanding is, is that on the 22nd, some of the reports, the procedures changed with some of the reporting reports that were coming in, in part, I think, because we were also asking for, for new and additional kinds of data to be able to take a look at. But whatever it was, I'm not sure that the data wasn't being reported as much as it was, it wasn't being recognized recognized for what it was after it was being reported, so it wasn't being included in the, in the, in the numbers. Uh, but the numbers that were being reported to the public showed what the census count was in the hospitals on any given day. So from day to day, you could tell how much the number was going up. You could also see the new admittances in the hospital, and they weren't adding up for the last week. Uh, so that's when it was identified that, wait a second, there are probably numbers that we're not catching or counting. Got it. Last thing. At the end of the day, if I'm an Austinite sitting at home, I'm seeing a few headlines that have the words 35-day shutdown in them. I want to know what my chances are of my community going into a potential shutdown in the days ahead. What do you say to those people? Well, one, you know, shutting down is a is a last resort. I mean, it's something that we that we that we don't want to do. Uh, and the question of whether or not we need to shut down principally survive, revolves around the question of what do we need to do in order to keep our, our hospitals and intensive care units from being overwhelmed. That's the context that that question was always coming up. Separate and apart from that conversation. Uh, some people in the community have, have come and asked me, uh, uh, assuming that we're able to prevent our hospitals from being overwhelmed, is there anything that we could or should be doing as a city that might better enable us to be able to open up schools in the fall and sustain the schools? So I've asked that question. Uh, we're going to talk about it at the council meeting on Thursday, because one thing we could do, potentially, is to close down, do a greater stay at home, you know, bring in maybe some of the phase one kinds of things, but tamp down the virus perhaps more than we need to in order to decrease the amount of virus that's in the community. And then why would we do that? Well, the question is, if we did that, would it better, would it increase our chances of being able to sustain schools opening? I don't know the answer to that question, but I want to be asking that, que that question, and, and I think we're going to discuss it on Thursday. Got it. So the message to the community is, we're not at the point of shutdown yet, but you want to be asking those questions. We're not at the point of shutting down now. Uh, we are concerned about the increase of hospitalizations. Uh, so we need to learn this week what the rate 
of increase is to see if we need to take action right now or if we have a little bit more time to decide to take action. We need to get a feel for how disciplined we have been over the last couple of weeks about wearing masks and social distancing to see what we can turn for the trajectory without having to stay down. And these are conversations that we want to have publicly and transparently so that the community can make its own decisions about what it wants to do, what the impact is on the economy, on people's lives, on people's health, and on our schools. And we're trying to get as much of that information out so that the community can make decisions.